I'm Alfred Enoch. I was a pupil here at Westminster for five years, and I'm back now to trace the history of the school in this short film. From its medieval beginnings on an ancient site, the school has always been closely connected to Westminster Abbey and the monarchy. But the archive collections reveal a much broader picture of changing fortunes, famous pupils and events which have shaped Westminster's identity. This is Yard, an open area at the centre of the school. You may be tempted to believe that Yard is the spot around which the school has always revolved, but actually, the origins of Westminster lie elsewhere. As far as we know, Westminster began as a charity school run by monks within a Benedictine monastery. And it was sited here, in what's now a busy and built-up street, a walk away from today's Westminster. That early school moved into Dean's Yard. I met consultant archaeologist Tim Tatton Brown there. Tim explained when Henry VIII dissolved the monasteries what happened next. And this is one of the positive things that Henry VIII was doing. Everybody just says, oh, he knocked down all these abbeys and dissolved them and took all the money and all the rest of it. That's certainly true, but in the great monasteries, mainly ones attached to cathedrals, he then had a brand new school made. And this is exactly what happened at Westminster here. We know exactly where Henry's school was. The evidence points to number 19 Dean's Yard. If one looks at the building's archaeology, you will find that there's a gap between two towers, and in between there was a space, and into that space was put a new building. The school then goes right on through this complicated period of Mary when she reintroduces for a very short time monks and an abbot. Then she dies and then Queen Elizabeth comes along and has a completely new foundation again of which the school is a part. And that is really the beginning of this school that Elizabeth I set up in 1560. If the Queen's refounding of Westminster School was a point of consolidation, then the arrival in 1638 of a former pupil as headmaster was the start of something quite different. The young Dr. Richard Busby had vision and inspired major changes in the school's fortunes. This. Archivist Elizabeth Wells told me about him. Busby arrives at an interesting time because his predecessor, Lambert Osbaldson, has just been ousted from the role of headmaster. And Busby comes in and really saves the day as well as extending the curriculum to include other languages and a broader range of study, Richard Busby also built his library. The number of pupils increases during Busby's time, but also the school's reputation increases. So much so that instead of just being local sons of the gentry, he's actually attracting aristocratic families, and it's become the place to send your sons. Busby was a survivor, someone who adapted to the times. In the archive collection and around the school, there's plenty of evidence of Dr. Busby the man and his long headmastership. He gets a job in 1638 and he manages to remain headmaster of Westminster School throughout the Civil War, the Commonwealth, the Restoration, the Glorious Revolution. And then he dies in post, aged 89 in 1695. From Elizabeth I's re-founding of Westminster School onwards, customs and traditions steadily became part of the school year. The autumn term at Westminster is called play term, because historically it always ended with the Latin play, the Westminster play, in December. A play put on by the scholars themselves, designed to inculcate a sense of fluency in the Latin language. Election term is named after the election of scholars. That dates back to the fact that at the end of the academic year, the scholars of Westminster were traditionally elected to the universities of Oxford and Cambridge. That tradition no longer exists, but we still use the election dinner as an opportunity to celebrate the achievements of all of the children, and that is why it's called the election term. And then there's Lent term. The Lent term, which obviously includes the season of Lent, has as its highlight Shrove Tuesday and the Westminster Greens perhaps our most unique and special tradition, which takes place up school. A large pancake is tossed over the Grease bar, the bar that used to hold a curtain which divided the upper from the lower school. The chef flips the pancake over the bar. The children scrap in a, in a, very, uh, in a very controlled environment to get the largest piece. 
The relative pieces are weighed by a scale, adjudicated by the dean. The winner is rewarded with a gold sovereign. Doesn't get to keep the coin, but does, on return of the coin, get a play. And a play is Westminster speak for a holiday, and hitherto I don't think any headmaster has refused to grant such an honour. I know Westminster is a school in built-up central London, but that's not how it was 300 years ago. In the 16th and 17th centuries, Westminster was essentially a small town, and it was on the edge of the countryside that stretched out to the west of us here upriver. As the Industrial Revolution speeded up, Westminster was besieged and went into decline. And if that wasn't enough, the school was locked into outdated ways of teaching. The Clarendon Commission was an investigation into standards in public schools, many of which were deemed to be failing. And the Clarendon Commission, then the Public Schools Act, which came out of it, enabled schools like Westminster to address some of those issues head on and to develop independently as academic institutions which could chart their course under new leadership. Things began to change with the arrival in 1846 of the then 35-year-old Henry Liddell. He's the one who starts to turn things around. Again, he's sort of very much uh, academically top-notch. He's a great teacher and he attracts pupils in that way. But the school's buildings also begin to improve. But if things on the home front were lifting, the international outlook was darkening. In August 1914, Britain declared war on Germany. Within a short while, there was a military presence in Dean's Yard and the school playing fields at Vincent Square were taken over by cavalry. Westminster found itself in a war zone. As the devastating consequences of the First World War gave way to a new awareness, Westminster moved forward with the times. The spirit of independent thinking, liberal values and social awareness was just as strong. But in 1939, the school found itself on the front line once more. During the Second World War, the school was evacuated, first down to Lansing, briefly to Exeter, and then to the Herefordshire Worcestershire border. And while the school was evacuated, the school site suffered enormously from the Blitz, and in May 1941, both school and college were completely gutted. The school's beautiful building suffered major damage from incendiary bombs. But as the war ended, a renaissance began. There was quite extraordinary leadership in the years after the Second World War, reinventing some of the school buildings to enable them to be used in new and different ways, but at the same time preserving the ethos of the school by the fact that the only building which was reconstructed exactly as it had originally appeared was the Busby Library, which is so resonant of the school's academic life and true heart. Queen Elizabeth I's constitution of the school in 1560 stated that the scholars should be pious, learned, noble, and industrious, an ideal to which the school continues to aspire. We are privileged to have a number of well-known alumni at the school. Christopher Wren was one, John Dryden was another. A school like Westminster has always attracted interesting people who often go on with our support and assistance to lead interesting lives, so A.A. Milne, um, of Winnie the Pooh fame is an old Westminster. Andrew Lloyd Webber was a Queen's scholar. Dido, the musician, was here at Westminster. The list is endless and we're very proud of them. Of course, this film has only given me an outline of Westminster's history. There are more stories to unfold and other interpretations to reveal. But if the past tells us one thing, it's that we don't know what may happen in the future. Only perhaps that the values of a liberal education will continue to be the heartbeat of Westminster School.